Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on harmful algal blooms in the Lower St. Johns River, the history, detection, formation, and prevention. We appreciate you joining us today. I am Jennifer Mitchell, and I'm responsible for the district's educational resources. And today we have Tiffany Trent, an environmental scientist for in the Bureau of Water Resources. Tiffany has been with the district almost 10 years and her work focuses on algal blooms and submerged aquatic vegetation. So she will give us a great overview of harmful algal blooms and, and the information that we can learn about them, how we can have impacts or how we do have impacts and how we can decrease those negative impacts. I would like to remind you that this is a part of our district series of webinars. We will have another webinar in two weeks, so on August 27th from 10.30 to 11, and it will be focused on submerged aquatic vegetation in Lake Apopka and how the restoration of that submerged aquatic vegetation has been going. Uh, the registration link for that webinar is available on our website, and we hope you will join us next week. Some of the technical information for this week as far as the, the housekeeping is that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website, as well as the previous webinars have been recorded and are available on our website. So if you missed some of those and are interested in getting the information, please check those out. Uh, also, everyone will be on mute throughout the presentation, but we do hope to get questions from you during the presentation and we will have a question and answer session at the end. So please enter your questions into that question box and if we do not get to your question during this presentation, we will answer directly to you in email. So Tiffany, thank you so much and take it away. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning. As Jennifer explained, um, I'm going to be talking to you guys about the harmful algal blooms in the lower St. John's River. So we're going to examine some of the history of these occurrences, uh, some of the ways that we can detect and track these algal blooms, how they actually form, and then some things that the district is doing actively to prevent these blooms from forming, and what you as private citizens can do to help us with that effort. Okay, first we're going to talk about some of the common Lower St. John's bloom forming cyanobacteria. And when we think about algal blooms, uh, we normally associate them with toxins, right? So, so um, substances that can be harmful to people or the environment. And that's true a lot of the times, but sometimes they are, they're just blooms by themselves without the toxins and uh, different, different species of phytoplankton that are not harmful. But this slide is going to focus more on that cyanobacteria, and those are those phytoplankton that actually do have the ability to produce the toxin that, that we're concerned about and that we want to keep down. Um, so first we have Microcystis originosa, and this is our most common bloom-forming cyanobacteria. And it actually was named for its toxin, micro, uh, microcystin, which is the most common toxin that we see in the lower St. John's River. And you can see the picture below. It kind of looks like this slimy, gummy, gooey stir, uh, substance at the surface. It can also produce these striation patterns that we see here in bright green. Another kind that we come across is called cylindrospermopsis, and it typically will produce the toxin cylindrospermopsin, which is the second most common toxin we come across in the St. John's River. And instead of forming these clumps or striations at the surface, this will actually dye the water sort of like an army green throughout. And the Diloxifermum, formerly known as Anabana, also does this. It also dyes the water column, this, this green color throughout, only it's a bit lighter and kind of a brighter green. And you can see from this picture um, that this was not taken in the St. John's River. It was, it was taken elsewhere with those uh, uh, tall trees in the background. Uh, this is uh, not a common bloom that we come across. Um, I've, I've only seen one on the Oswawaha River in my, my 10 years here. Lastly, we have Amphizomenon flasaqua, and it is very, very unique in how it displays. 
And you can see the picture at the bottom here. It looks like these grass clippings at the surface, and sometimes they can kind of clump together. And again, we don't often have this in the St. Johns River. We, we did see this a, a couple times, I think uh, last year or the year before in um, Noonan's Lake. Um, it was really uh, proliferant there for, um, for a couple of days. So how do these things form to begin with? Um, algal blooms have been around long before people have, and they'll likely be here after we're, we're long gone. They have some naturally occurring triggers, and one of those is slow water circulation. So if you think about a stagnant lake or stagnant pond that doesn't get a lot of water inflow or outflow, that's going to be one of the triggering factors for algal blooms. Uh, you would not see an algal bloom form in, in contrast to a fast-moving uh, stream or creek. Uh, higher water temperatures also can induce algal blooms, and in fact, if all other factors are equal, the higher water temperatures are the main driving force um, for, for triggering an algal bloom. Also, extreme weather events can trigger blooms, hurricanes, floods, and droughts. Uh, droughts can produce that sort of stagnation um, in the ponds and the lakes like we talked about with no water going in or out. But then the reverse can be true too with hurricanes and floods. And when we get an influx of those heavy rains, what that can do is inundate the river with a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus from, from the land, what we use to fertilize our lawns and things like that. So either of those two extremes can, can trigger a bloom. Uh, people also contribute to the algal bloom formation. And we just talked about the nitrogen, um, the nutrients from farmland and the urban runoff, the NNPs there. And although we we are working hand in hand with a lot of our our ag farmers, and they they uh, they have some really neat programs to help reduce that input into the river that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, ur urban runoff can include things like over fertilizing your lawn or washing your car a lot, and then those nutrients will eventually end end up back into our water system. So all of these nutrients will flow downstream, and then we can have an overabundance of algae. And now there's a lot of other factors that can contribute to the algal blooms that we, we just won't have time to talk about today. But however they occur, um, they're, they're not desirable. Even if they're not toxic, they're unsightly, they can be smelly, and they drive away tourists and people from, from the waters and from the beaches. Uh, some of the consequences of algal blooms include economic, uh, there can be a loss to the seafood industry, restaurants, and tourism. Uh, several years ago, there were the red tides along the coast. And if you're a tourist there, you're probably not going to want to rent a condo or a hotel room if there's a red tide. There's also environmental consequences. In uh, 2005 and 10, uh, the St. Johns River experienced uh, fish kills due to um, elevated algal blooms. And they can also uh, have health consequences for people. We can develop skin rashes and have asthma attacks or shellfish poisoning. And it can also harm our pets. I, I think I, there were articles last year or the year before about dogs getting sick from the microcystis in, in South Florida waters. So how do we measure these blooms? How do we track these algal blooms and figure out where they're going and in time to alert the public? We have several different tools that we use. Um, one is remote sensing, and this here is a satellite image of the Lower St. Johns River, starting from about Lake George there at the bottom. And this is a, an overview of chlorophyll A, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but basically um, chlorophyll A is used as a proxy for measuring phytoplankton. So all these phytoplankton and cyanobacteria, they share this unique pigment. And when that's measured in a water sample, that gives us a really good idea about the phytoplankton biomass. So the higher the chlorophyll A values, the more phytoplankton is going to be in the water. And here we can see this key on the lower left-hand corner. Uh, the cooler colors represent low chlorophyll A values, and the warmer colors represent higher chlorophyll A values. Now, this doesn't necessarily translate into toxic blooms, but it does tell us that there, there is an abundance of phytoplankton in these areas. We can also take instantaneous measurements with our field instruments. And what we're looking at here is called a chlorophyll A probe. And this will tell us instantaneously, again, uh, what the, the chlorophyll A values are in the, in the field, so we can, we can track those in real time. 
We can also take water samples and have them analyzed at our lab. And this is a shot of our spectrophotometer. And this is basically considered the gold standard for measuring our chlorophyll A values. Uh, this is a little expensive and time consuming. So what our samplers do, they'll take a water sample in the field, put it on ice, transport it back to the lab, and then our chemist will run it through this machine and we'll get the, the final numbers days or weeks later. So it, it just it is a little bit more lengthy and time consuming, but it is the gold standard and gives us the most accurate measurements of chlorophyll A. And we do have a new method that we're, we're kind of experimenting with, with um, what's called a chlorophyll content meter. And without getting too much into the details of this, I'll, I'll just give you all uh, the gist of it. We will take a filtered water sample uh, from the field and we'll, we'll run it through a filtration system and measure the amount of filtered water. And then in the second picture, we'll take that filter paper and put it in the device, put it in the chlorophyll content meter, and that will give us a number that we can then compare with our readings that the spectrophotometer that the, the, the lab produced chlorophyll A values gave us. So if we take enough of these paired samples together, we can see here at the graph on the lower right hand corner, uh, this, this presents a really, really good relationship between these two values. And I don't know how many, how many of y'all remember from high school or college, the uh, uh, y equals mx plus b. So this is, um, this is a really, really good linear relationship between these two numbers. And what we can do, we can take this equation up here, the, the y equation, with us in the field and just take the measurements with the CCM200 and that's going to give us a really, really good idea of the chlorophyll A content and hence the phytoplankton biomass in the water. And again, this is not as accurate as the spectrophotometer, but it's, it's a lot cheaper and it's very, very quick to do. So it, it is a tool that we have in, in our toolbox that we like to use. And if any of uh, y'all are interested in reading up more about this new method, uh, we've got a publication out on it that describes it in a lot more detail. So please let me know and I'd be happy to forward you a copy of that. So where do these harmful algal blooms occur in the first place? Well, when we think about the lower St. John's River, uh, we need to realize that not all portions of the water are the same. They, they each have their own water chemistry and their own phytoplankton makeup. So what we've done here, in order to look at it more closely, we've divided the river into five different sections based on that section's water chemistry and phytoplankton makeup. And you can see here the red, the oligohalian reach up at the top, that's going to be the saltiest, right? Because that's closer to the ocean, that's going to get a lot more influx uh, for salinities from, from the Atlantic Ocean. And right off to the side of that in the orange is Doctor's Lake and in yellow is the freshwater and at the southernmost ends we have our two lakes lake george and crescent lake and when we look at all of these together uh, the southernmost three sections we kind of consider like our freshwater reach uh, these are going to be the sections that get the least amount of influx of salinity they're they have miles and miles of natural shoreline buffering and they're a lot less densely populated um, unlike the oligohaline reach, um, this section, the oligohaline and Doctor's Lake, has the highest uh, fluctuating salinities. There's a lot more people there. It's uh, Jacksonville and Fleming Island, more highly urbanized. So it's going to have more degraded water quality, right? This is uh, the downstream most section of the river. So any nutrients that haven't absorbed or been taken out further south are going to end up here, and they're going to have extra inputs from, from all the people. So this is a map of some algal bloom collections, and this is measuring that common toxin we talked about on the first slide, the microcystin. And you can see at the key, at the, the bottom left-hand corner of this map, again, we have the, the smaller, cooler circles representing minimal to no detection. And as we get a higher and higher of, of toxin value, the circles get larger and, and warmer, right? And we can see here the oligohaline reach starts right about here. 
and we see that the, the vast majority of these blooms are occurring at the oligohaline reach north and into Dockers Lake. And, and I didn't have this on here, but uh, this, this data was compiled from 2005 to 2017, I believe. You'll notice right at the top um, where the river deposits into the Atlantic Ocean, there's not a whole lot of severe blooms, and that's because that water is just too salty. And uh, micro, microcystis has a range of salinity that it can survive in. So right up near the Mayport area, we don't see a whole lot of these really, really toxic blooms. We do have some in the Crescent Lake area. And again, this, um, this lake is, it is a bit more stagnant than Lake George. So it's got Dunn's Creek that it, it fluxes water in and out of to the main river stem, but it, it doesn't have a lot of inputs and outputs like Lake George does. So the good news is um, that chlorophyll A values have been decreasing in the vast majority of these river sections. And again, we use chlorophyll A as a measurement of the phytoplankton biomass, the phytoplankton presence. And this is a representation of data from 2005 to 2020. And it, it's, not, it's not very, very linear. There's a, there's a bit of variability here in all the, the sections. But for the most part, the chlorophyll A values are on the decline, which is good news. And, and the freshwater, it seems to be unchanged or maybe increasing a bit. Um, but overall, um, especially in the Doctors Lake and the Oligohaline Reach, they're decreasing. And that's, that's what we want to see. We, we don't want to see an increase of the, uh, the, the phytoplankton biomass, especially in these areas. So what are some of the things that we're doing to help prevent algal bloom formation to begin with? Uh, one of our projects that we had for several years is um, the Regional Stormwater Treatment Area, or RST. And this picture we're looking at is an aerial shot at the Edgefield Station. So we're looking toward the river, um, we're, we're looking westward, so this, this area is going to be on the east side of the river. And basically what these systems are designed to do is take water from the agricultural runoff, run it through this system so that it can absorb the nitrogen and phosphorus before it's redeposited back out into the river. And I don't know if you guys can see this um, uh, kind of dark area to the left of the canal inflow station, but that is the, that's the dog branch stream. And what the canal inflow station does is it captures a lot of that water and, and deposits it into a basin that is then pumped through into this pond. And you can see how the pond is nice and long, um, elongated S shaped, and that's intentional. So the water takes its time kind of flowing through here. And in this process, there's gonna be a lot of phosphorus settling out to the bottom. After that, the water is then deposited into the wetland area and you can see um, the wetland on the on the right hand side that is just really really loaded with a lot of emergent vegetation so what that's going to do is going to help take up uh, the remaining uh, phosphorus and nitrogen in there before it's finally deposited into the wetland outflow and then is redirected back into the river now we like to measure the efficiency of this system right so we want to see how well it's, it's doing its job and the 2019 data showed an overall system um, of a 71% reduction in total nitrogen and 67% reduction in total phosphorus. And other years before that had similar results. So we're, we're very pleased with that. Um, something else that our, our local farmers do is they have what's called an era drain system. And this system is basically designed to keep nutrients and moisture in the soil for longer periods of time. So if you look in the center, you see this water, uh, the structure for water control. And basically these farmers can use these control structures to manage the water table elevation. So um, if you think about it, we want, the, the farmers want to keep the water and the fertilizer, the nutrients closer to the crops, right? And that's what this, this control mechanism does. So instead of all of the water and nutrients going straight to the bottom and then straight out to the river, this device allows them to keep that water and keep those nutrients closer to the crops. So the crops can take up the nutrients so there will be less nutrients deposited into the river. 
and it, it's a real win-win for the river and the farmers um, because the farmers don't have to use as much water and uh, don't have to use as much fertilizer because they're 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 managing it in this way. Um, another program we have is the Gizzard Shad Removal in Lake George, and this started in 2012. Uh, gizzard shad are a native fish in Florida, and they they really really like to reproduce in high nutrient areas. And the fry, the the tiny fish, when they're born, uh, they feed on the the plankton in the water. But as they become adults, their feeding pattern changes, and they they then become bottom feeders. So in in rivers and lakes, we have uh, what's called legacy nutrients or legacy phosphorus and nitrogen that settles to the bottom of the lake. And that is not normally redistributed back into the water unless it's dug up, unless it's disturbed. And unfortunately, that's just what these fish do. Um, there's a lot of them and they, they reproduce quickly. They outcompete other game fish like bass and sunfish, and then they... Um, they they dig up a lot of that that legacy those legacy nutrients and artificially raise the nutrients in in Lake George. So on average, um, I think this data is from 2012 to 2018. There was an average of 9,200 pounds of phosphorus removed per season, and a season is four months long, and the cost was 55 cents a pound. So that's a, a pretty decent bang for our buck for this project. Um, another thing we encourage is septic to sewer conversions. And right now the district is partnering with Clay County to convert 79 septic tanks to central sewer that are adjacent to Doctors Lake. And if we remember back on one of our previous slides with the, with the algal blooms, we noticed that there was a lot of intense uh, toxic algal blooms around Doctors Lake. So we're, we're really hoping that this conversion system will, will help to mitigate that a bit. And this project is estimated to reduce in loading, nitrogen loading to the lake by 1,500 pounds a year. We're also partnering with DEP in our efforts to track, monitor, and mitigate algal blooms. And if you guys want to take down this address at the top, it's floridadepe.gov backslash algal bloom. And anytime you see an algal bloom in the St. John's River or you know anywhere in our watershed, you can take down its coordinates, take photos, and then report it to this site. And there's a button here that's the second button down that says report algal blooms, and that'll that'll help everyone track and monitor these things. Um, DEP is also uh, partnering with us in helping us for funding for more water quality stations, uh, analysis of algal toxins, and algal identification. And all of this information is posted statewide on their dashboard, so, so you guys can see, see our efforts and, and see how we're progressing. So what are the, some of the things you can do to help prevent algal blooms? Uh, you can minimize or eliminate lawn fertilizer, right? And we, we talked about that a few slides ago, how a lot of the, the fertilizers and the nutrients will eventually end up in our water system somewhere. Uh, you can help minimize erosion, especially along the river. So if you have a home along the river and, you know, you, you, you want to keep your property, you want to keep it from, from slipping into, into the river from, from heavy rains, um, you can either have a riprap there to, to help that, to help minimize the, the wave erosion there, or you can encourage native emergent vegetation. And what that's going to do, the, the vegetation is going to, the roots are going to hold that soil better together there, and it's also going to uptake a lot of those nitri nitrogen and phosphorus. And it looks really pretty too. You can maintain your septic tank or switch to local sewer. And we talked about that uh, a few minutes ago, how the um, uh, uh, local sewer systems um, hopefully will help decrease the nitrogen input into Doctors Lake. And pick up after your pets. Uh, a lot of people don't think that just leaving bits of doggy doodle here and there are gonna really do anything to our water source, but if enough people do that, then a lot of nutrients are eventually going to end back up into the river and into our, our water source. And lastly, don't over-irrigate and don't wash your nutrients away from your yard, especially if you're using reclaimed water. 
And that's, that's been kind of the main theme throughout here that um, nutrients runoff uh, will eventually end back up into our water source and, and into the St. John's River. And I think there are, if, if, you, if you can do little things like buy um, a car wash soap that is uh, low in phosphorus or phosphorus free, that, that would be a help. Every little bit helps. So in summary, we learned what algal blooms are and how they form. We learned that there are natural forces and then man-made forces that can encourage algal blooms to form. Uh, we learned the various methods that are used to track and measure algal blooms. We know that we have the satellite capabilities, the instant field monitoring with our chlorophyll A probe, the lab produced uh, chlorophyll A results with our spectrophotometer, and then also that new method with the CCM200 that we're using. Uh, we learned where uh, most algal blooms occur along the river. Uh, we didn't get into when. Um, I, I deleted a slide from that, but um, we did say a few slides ago that uh, all other things being equal, higher temperatures are going to encourage algal blooms, and that's going to be the main driving force. So it's it's the summertime that we would expect when temperatures are higher that we that we see the most algal blooms. And again, we did see that in the Oligahaline Reach and Doctors Lake over the, the last few years, there have been more algal blooms uh, than in the freshwater reaches. Uh, we also learned uh, the different methods uh, used to minimize algal bloom formation. We learned what the district is doing um, to help mitigate that and who we're partnering with, the different farmers and DEP, and also talked about what U.S. private citizens can do also in helping us with those efforts. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was a fabulous overview of, of the, the history, the problems, and what we can do. Uh, we have a ton of questions, so I know that we will not be able to get to all of them in our time frame, and I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, there was a question about um, phytoplankton. So you started talking about phytoplankton, and um, I know that's a really general term. And the question has to do with, um, isn't phytoplankton good and an important source of food for wildlife? Oh, absolutely, yes. And what we want is biodiversity in phytoplankton. Um, what, we, what we don't want is a monoculture that we see a lot with the, with the cyanobacteria. Um, but yes, we, we do want phytoplankton there in its proper proportions. And, and we did talk about the gizzard shad and how the fry feed off the phytoplankton. And that's true for a lot of smaller species that start out. So yes, phytoplankton is absolutely necessary, but what we want to avoid is encouraging the phytoplankton, the cyanobacteria, to reproduce in numbers that are undesirable. And this one kind of follows up on that of, does the testing that you're doing identify the different types of phytoplankton that are um, in it and let you know whether or not it contains that cyanobacteria? That's, that's an excellent question. That's actually two different tests that we do, and I, I didn't have enough time to get into that. I could, I could talk for hours about this. Um, we, we did collect a lot of uh, taxa information and toxin information. So the taxa information, the samples that we sent to UF, do tell us, um, sometimes down to the genus and if, if, they're, um, if they're specific enough down to the species, what is the most dominant, um, what are the most dominant phytoplankton or cyanobacteria in that sample? And we can also simultaneously collect toxin samples. And um, we, we do have a report that links those two together that, that give us an idea of who is producing what. So which cyanobacteria are, is producing toxin in which area of the river? And that, that's a much, much, much more detailed um, presentation and study. But um, if, if that person would like that report to, to look at it more closely, I'd be more than happy to send that to them. Okay. We also have a, a question that um, relates to stormwater retention ponds and, uh, and their role in potentially improving water quality since uh, those are regulated in our developments. Are okay. You able and, to and um, I that I, I'll try to answer that. That's more um, uh, Pam Way's department, but I, I'll, I'll try to answer that. I, I did work on the RSPs for a while, um, but not the the stormwater retention ponds. But I'll, I'll try to answer that. Yeah. 
Uh, it, what, what is the question? <laughs> oh, so it was it was more do do um, stormwater ponds in our developments and in uh, communities do they help with uh, improving water quality? So in our uh, in our developments, and I guess one of the things that's really important is that those uh, to answer the question a little bit is that those are designed in our residential communities for flood protection primarily and the water quality is somewhat an added benefit. You're, you're correct, yeah, that, that's my understanding as well. Um, I, I don't, I, I can't speak to anyone. Um, I, I don't know specifically which one they're talking about, um, but, but yeah, my understanding is that they're mainly for flood control. And I, I, have, seen, I have seen neighborhood groups that, that work to improve the water quality of their, their pond structures by planting, desirable um, emergent uh, vegetation that can take up a lot of those nutrients. So there's a lot that the community can do themselves to, to turn those retention ponds in, into healthy ponds. Um, but I don't, I can't speak uh, to as whether or not they're all designed for that. I, I think like you said, yeah, they're, they're mostly designed for flood control. Well, fabulous. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. If we did not get to your question, Today, I will email you and get you an answer. Uh, I appreciate all the questions and all of the interest. And please join us for our next webinar on submerged aquatic vegetation and its recovery in Lake Apopka. And Tiffany, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. My pleasure. Thank you all for attending.